What's the word, y'all? The other day I was sitting around and I was thinking about how unique NBA fandom is compared to the other leagues around the world or the other sports around the world. Because I would call myself a casual MLB fan, NFL fan, and a casual soccer slash non-American football fan. And the thing that makes the NBA fandom unique is that we have this obsession with player movement and trades. I I'm so obsessed with that type of stuff that in fantasy football this year, I've already made like 10 different trades. Already! I'm part of that is because my team wasn't good to start off with. So I needed some trades, but another part of that is just I'm just so much in an NBA mindset that trades have just become a norm for me when these other leagues, yes, of course we have trades, but we don't have as many as the NBA. Remember at the trade deadline last season, there was only two teams that did not make any moves, the Miami Heat and the Chicago Bulls. It, it worked out well for one of the teams less well for the other but we just see so much player movement so much player movement that we just started preseason and there are so many articles talking about people that could get traded that's just what we like to consume we like to see chaos so that intro was just a way to say that hey um andy bailey at bleacher pork put together a list of one player each nba team should put on a trade block Let's react. Now, again, I'm going to remind people when we react to these things, we're going to talk, we're going to at least go over all 30 teams. We won't stop to talk about all 30 because some of them are not going to be interested enough to talk about. All right, the Atlanta Hawks, Clint Capella. This makes sense to me, and this is coming from the perspective of a guy that is not an Atlanta Hawks fan but have consumed a lot of Atlanta Hawks games over the last couple seasons. I like the potential and potential versatility of Onyeka Kongwu. And over the last couple seasons, if you've been listening to my podcast, you know that I've been waiting for the moment when Onyeka Kongwu becomes too good for them to not start him. And it hasn't happened just yet. The Atlanta Hawks are a team that's trying to compete. Got the conference finals a couple years ago with Clint. They're trying to compete. So in their mind, they might not want to bench Clint Capella in the sake of youth because they want to be competitive right now. Hopefully this is the year that Yeka Kongu does take that because, I mean, he does on the defensive side of the things, again, a, a Walmart version of what Bam Adebayo has been able to do when it comes to the switchability, being able to guard the guards or play and drop. He does that. But in spurts. Obviously, Bam is doing it every single night. That's why he's a guy that gets widely respected. Well, you watched yesterday's video. He's not widely respected, but uh, recognized for the most part as one of the best defensive players in ball. And Yeka Kongu has potential to potentially be that down the line, just not yet. But he shows glimpses here and there. Next, we have Jordan Walsh for the Boston Celtics. We don't need to stop here. This makes sense. They made all the trades already. If there's anybody that would hold value on their bench, it would be Jordan Walsh. He's, what, 19 years old. Hit some shots in preseason. His defensive versatility is where you're really excited about. He was a former high school, like, top recruit or whatever. Um, and then fell in the draft and everything. But like, I don't know if the Boston Celtics are looking to make moves because they already made a lot. But if they go to the deadline and, like, man, we missing one last small piece is coming off our bench. Jordan Walsh might be a guy that they trade to get that piece. Lonnie Walker for the Brooklyn Nets. The Nets are one of those teams that I don't know exactly where they're going to fall in the standing. So if it's February and they're not as good as maybe they could be, and they're looking to move some people that's not a part of their core group. Lonnie Walker, over the last couple of seasons, his last year in San Antonio, and then with the Lakers, he showed that he could come in off the bench and fill it up for you. So that makes sense. Gordon Hayward. Ooh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I got to read this one. I got to read this one. If he can stay healthy, which is a massive if over the last several seasons, Gordon Hayward can help the Charlotte Hornets uh, take a step toward competitiveness this season, okay? They aren't likely to go much further than that, though. Ah, so it's just saying, like, hey, if he's good enough and healthy enough, maybe a team would throw a protected first-round pick to get three months of Gordon Hayward because he is a free agent. I, yeah, the Charlotte Hornets don't have a ton over there that's not part of the core core of Brandon Miller, LaMelo, and, like, Mark Williams, so, like, who you want to put Terry Rozier in the spot. Gordon Hayward has an expiring contract. Might be easier to move, but he also is making $34 million a year, so maybe it's not easier to move. Lonzo Ball. Um, when I read this article, I assumed that Lonzo Ball was going to be the piece here. Zo obviously is going to miss the entirety of the season. He's got a player option next year that hopefully he's healthy by that time and he can suit up. But if they don't believe that is the case or they don't believe that he's going to come back 100%, his $21 million could be used as salary filler plus draft capital to go get somebody. I'm not a huge fan of that idea as a Bulls fan. I mean, that's I don't know who they would potentially get. Um, but it is a hefty amount of money to pay somebody that's on the IR. So if we're at February and for whatever reason the Bulls look good, which, you know, uh, then his $21 million plus, I don't know, another contract on the roster might be good enough to go get somebody that can be a needle mover, but nobody expects the Bulls to be good. Karis LeVert, uh, yeah, they got a lot of wings over there now. They they got George Yang, who's more of a four. They also got Ice Kokoro, who looked really good in his first preseason game. Max Struess and Karis LeVert, who just signed an extension. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., 
man, the, the Dallas Mavericks are one of those teams that I cannot predict. They are one of the hardest teams in the league for me to predict. Luka and Kyrie are both studs, but it's like, okay, after that, what? You know, after that, what's going to happen? But there was a stat last season that when he shot like 50% from three in a game, they were really, really good. Uh, so when he is on, he helps you win games. But if he's having a okay to mediocre game, you know how it goes. Zeke Naji, man, do y'all remember the video two years ago where I was saying that I'm excited for Zeke Naji's basketball play for the season and he basically did not crack the rotation at all? This is the year where they need Zeke Naji to be in the rotation. They lost some people off the bench. Uh, they, they lost Bruce Brown. They lost, lost Jeff Green, who were two of their top eight players in their rotation. They need somebody who can be like a backup for Zeke Naji. He has the potential to be a good shooter. He has the potential to play some solid defense, but we haven't seen it a lot in his career. But if there's a rebuilding team that wants to take a shot, Zeke Naji is the type of dude that I would want to take a shot with. Bojan Bogdanovic. This, this is a guy that has been on the block slash in articles about being traded forever. Uh, this is very contingent on if the Detroit Pistons just decide to kind of trade a lot of their vets because he is one of the perfect pieces to put alongside Kay Cunningham because he has always been a 38 to 42% three-point shooter throughout his career and Kay Cunningham needs space to do what he could do. So this is that they're like, hey, we're going completely you. Then it's time for us to finally cash in on Bodanovich. Moses Moody. We talked about this on the Kenny Beecham podcast, which is in the description, about how the Warriors a few years ago were trying to straddle the two different timelines, the Steph Curry timeline plus the youth timeline with Jordan Poole, with James Wiseman, Kaminga, Moses Moody. Now, Jordan Poole and James Wiseman are gone. Kaminga looks like a player that is definitely going to be in the rotation. Moses Moody a little bit less than that. So maybe there's a team out there that's willing to take a chance on Moses Moody in the sake of adding another player that fit the Steph Curry timeline. Jay Sean Tate. Uh, Jay Sean Tate, he's... He, Remember he was a rookie. He felt like he was 46 years old when he was a rookie. Quality, quality NBA player, but they have so many playable bodies in Houston. A lot of those being more youthful than Jay Sean Tate that you might want to prioritize their development over Jay Sean. Buddy Hill. No need to talk about it. Buddy Hill's name has been on the block for the last couple weeks. Maybe it's been like a month or so. We don't know if he's actually going to get moved, but he's a guy. He's the oldest player in the league with zero playoff minutes. Uh, so getting him to a playoff team could be good for his career. We know he can choose one of the greatest volume three-point shooters of all time. Next, we have Terrence Mann. Don't tell the Clippers this. They're they not, they not thinking about trading no Terrence Mann. But at the same time, he is the only player outside of the core guys, the super core guys of the Kawhis and the Paul Georges that hold value across the association. So if they do want to go in a little bit more, he is the player uh, that holds the value. This is also really fun to me because everybody assumes that Terrence Mann is his young dude. Brother, he, he is my age. He's about to be at least. And I'm, an, I'm old in this. In my industry, I'm old. In NBA industry, he's young but not young. You feel me? D'Angelo Russell. Yeah. D'Angelo Russell's contract is actually perfect to get moved. Two years, $36 million. Obviously, in the playoffs last season, he lost his starting spot and eventually just ended up looking not great. And the Lakers need playoff performance. Now, I'm not saying that D'Angelo Russell cannot be that uh, this season because I don't really know. I can't predict the future. But... Uh, if there was a world where there was a starish player that was disgruntled that doesn't hold a ton of value, I'm not talking about Joel Embiid or something, but like, you know, like a mid-tier star that's not super valuable, D'Angelo Rossi, Rui, and we like Rui around here, I'm not saying he's going to get traded, if you add those two contracts together, it's a max spot. So I'm just, I'm not saying that's what the Lakers' goal is, because again, I think Rui's more a part of the core than D'Angelo Russell, but you never know how the season's going to break. And if a guy is out there that's significantly better than both of them, the Lakers are not a stranger to buying in more. I don't have anything to say about Xavier Tillman. Um, has had above average marks in dunks and threes, estimated plus minus. Great. Good job. That's all I can really, that's all I can really say. Tyler Hero, another player that's just been in trade rumors over the last season. He will continue to be in trade rumors. That's just the nature of his job at this, <laughs> at this point. It, won't go, it will not go away. As long as the Miami Heat are trying to contend, and there's superstars maybe available. Tyler Hero's name will be in these conversations. Is it warranted? I don't know. I'm a Tyler Hero fan. I think Tyler Hero's a stud. Um, but if it's a superstar uh, like Damian Lillard was or a superstar like Joel Embiid, if that ever happens, then he has to be in it because he's the one that holds the value. So he just didn't hold value to Portland necessarily. But he is a valuable player and a good player too. Marjan Bochamp. Makes sense. They traded everything else. Who else, who else in that team would hold any value other than the 23-year-old player? Now, he did not shoot the ball, ball, ball very well in the regular season. He got to summer league and he looked really good. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to play real minutes for the Milwaukee Bucks, especially in the regular season. But if they want to add more depth or 
a more veteran-led player, Marjan might be the guy that's on the move. Carl Anthony Towns. Woo! All right, so everybody makes the argument with Carl Anthony Towns being on the block. You traded a bunch to get Rudy Gobert. You signed Nas Reed for a lot of money. And then, of course, you gave Carl Anthony Towns a super max extension not too long ago. All those players, for the most part, are fives more than fours. I know they're trying Carl Anthony Towns at the four, and it could work out, but we see him more of a five. So their fives have accumulated so much money. It's like, man, is it worth paying this much money to three different centers on our roster? Probably not. So who is the guy that gets moved? Well, you're not going to get your, your weight back and value for Rudy Gobert because he was significantly worse this year than the year that you traded for him. Carl Anthony Towns is the one player that you could get value at, even though he's making super max money, he's a stud. He was just all NBA two years ago, and he had an injury last year. You know what I'm saying? So we know that Cat can really, really hoop, even though he's had his own playoff woes. So if you were going to trade something in that center court, it's probably Cat, and I don't love it, but it, through the process of elimination, through the people that are available, he makes the most sense. Jonas Valanciunas for the Pelicans. I like uh, Big Val, um, but I don't know if I really love him alongside Zion and Brandon Ingram. So I would look to this man i know this is well done but when i when i thought about the idea or not it wasn't just a me thing but throughout nba fandom of miles turner being the five in new orleans now that's a dead mission because he's a pacer and he just got his money last season so shout out to our girl our, our guy miles but he felt perfect to be alongside the Pelicans. And when he was on a trade block, I'm like, Pelicans better pick up the phone. Pelicans got to pick up the phone. You got a lot of Milwaukee Bucks picks. You got picks that don't even you don't even own yourself. So go trade some of the picks to go get Miles because he's on the block. They talking about L.A. No, you need to step in. They didn't do that. Val had a good season and all. He's a, one of the few bruisers type type guys on the on the in the league still. And he can stretch a little bit more, but not the perfect fit. R.J. Barrett. Sheesh. A big bunny to R.J. Uh, only 23 years old, as they're speaking about here. R.J. Barrett. I like R.J. Uh, and maybe I'm biased because he's a left-hander. I think I, left-handers get a little bit more praise in my mind just because, you know, me too. Uh, but if I'm trading R.J. Barrett, and then look, I'm not saying that R.J.'s a stud, even though in the playoffs last season, after a few really bad games, he, he got back on track. Um at 23 years old, he might be the one of the main pieces in that New York Knicks superstar trade that they've been waiting for. Uh, but that's all I can, I can really see. I mean, for a, a Knicks team that's trying to compete, he's not the perfect third option by any means. So I can understand that too. Ujman Zhang, I was wondering, will it be him or Poku? With them having so much young talent and so little roster spots and so little playing time, you knew that one of these dudes they drafted pretty high would be here because there might be a team out there willing to take a chance on a guy that was in the lottery and a raw prospect for sure. Uh, but they just had to, they have to make a decision about that roster. They just have too many young players. John Isaac. John Isaac looked pretty good in that first preseason game. I was impressed. I was impressed. We know his defensive upside. We know what we can do defensively. But the problem is he hasn't played at all over the last couple seasons. Uh, so if I am an opposing GM, I'm waiting to see him play a couple games, you know, a um, one month straight stretch before I'm interested in training for him. But there is no denying his versatility defensively. I mean, I was a big Jonathan Isaac fan when he came out of uh, Florida State. I was like, oh, this guy's going to be a stud defensively. And he was before all of the injuries. So I want to see him put it together a little bit more. James Harden. Okay, cool. Yeah, we know that. Uh, Bo Bo. We'll see, man. I, I Listen, listen, listen. I have been called that I'm like a Bobo hater, which is absurd to me. I just call it how it is. And Bobo had a lot of cool stretches with the Orlando Magic last season, but for the most part, he was out of position all the time. He, he didn't know how to use his length as good as you would expect a guy that has been this size since he was two years old. And he overall just wasn't very good last season. So I used that to talk about him. You know what I'm saying? His potential there, for, for sure, absolutely. But eventually you have to turn that potential into actuality. And he's still a young player. But I also can only talk about the things that I've, su I've seen. And I can't get too high with the highs. And can't get too low with the lows. Malcolm Brogdon. 100%. We know that. Davion Mitchell. I'm excited for Davion Mitchell's season, man. He went out there and got leg sleeves, arm sleeves. This is not the day. This picture right here is not the Davion Mitchell that we see nowadays. You gonna win. If you ain't watched Kings games yet in the preseason, watch Davion Mitchell now. The brother has... All of the tattoos in the world, and they're clean. Shout out to him. He's also a little bit older than the typical young guy. He's 25 years old, which is, I think, the same age as De'Aaron Fox. And, of course, De'Aaron Fox has been in the league for 100 years, and, and Davion's been in the league for two. Uh, so, or I'm sorry, three. 
Um, so it, it is a, a bit weird when you see like four year players end up making it just because we're not, it's not normal anymore. <laughs> you know, everybody coming in at 19, 20 years old. Uh, but uh, what they're saying here is that if there is a younger team that's willing to take a chance on Davion Mitchell, then maybe the Sacramento Kings can flip him for a more veteran backup point guard that can perform better in the playoffs. Cool, cool idea, I guess. Doug McDermott. The other day, when I was watching Spurs versus OKC Thunder, Doug McDermott was getting garbage time minutes, and I was so sad for him. Um, great shooter, and maybe he can get to a playoff team and provide that shooting for them, I guess. But garbage time minutes in preseason is uh, nasty work. Woo, Pascal Siakam. I have not talked about the Toronto Raptors much over the last offseason or so because I have no idea what to feel and think about their direction um, of course, Fred Van Vliet left. They brought it in the shooter who's coming off a gold medal and everything. But I don't know what to think about this team at all. And I'm sure there are a lot of uh, Raptors fans that feel the same way. So I've kind of steered away from talking about them much because I don't know what to expect. Should we expect Pascal to potentially be moved? Should we expect OG Ananobi to possibly be moved considering he said he was going to test his market regardless? I don't know. I remember a couple months ago. He said, Pascal, at least this is rumored that he was said that whatever team you trade me to, I'm not signing an extension. You know, so maybe that turns off other general men. I'm not trading for him if he's not willing to put his name on that dot line yet. So I don't know. I don't know. But he's a valuable player in this league. He's a good player, a great player in this league. But it's, if, I'm tra if I'm trading for him, I need some type of commitment longer than a couple months of this season. Then we got Kelly Olenek. Uh Yeah, they just added John Collins, and, and they already have Walker Kessler and Larry Marketing. Uh, Kelly Olenek was really, really good for Utah Jazz last season, but a uh, log jam over there in that position. Landry Shamit is dead last. Landry Shamit has been in the league like five years and he's played for like five teams. His rookie season, not you could not have ex you could not have convinced me that Landry Shamit wasn't going to be a player. That not I didn't think he was going to be great. I never think he was going to be an All Star, but a high level, consistent role player. And every team has. Had him and then let him go after a season. <laughs> it's just one of those guys is going to move the ton, like Malcolm Brogdon nowadays. All right, so that's one player that every team should have on the trading block. I'm very interested to see what y'all think. Your favorite team, who not that, not who you want to see traded, because that's a little bit harsh. But who do you think should be on the trade block from your favorite team? Of course, as always, I'll be in the comment section reading and or replying. You, you know how I go.